In this recording, I'm going to assume that you know the definition of the Laplace transform for a function f of t. That's the third line that I've written here. Also that you're familiar with the notation, capital F of s, for the transform, and that you've met the expression for the Laplace transform of a derivative, the f dt. In fact, that it is s times f of s minus little f of zero. If you're not familiar with any of these results, then you should watch some more elementary screencasts on the subject of the Laplace transform to familiarize yourself. I want to focus on that middle result, L of df dt. The effect of differentiating the original f is to multiply the Laplace transform by s and make a, a, a shift by f of zero, but that's not very important. The point is that it's multiplication by s. Supposing we want to take the Laplace transform of an integral of a function. Integration is the reverse procedure for differentiation. What might we expect for the Laplace transform? Well, the reverse procedure for multiplying by s could well be dividing by s. Is it possible that the Laplace transform of an integral of f will involve division of the capital F by s? But it turns out that is the case. We're going to prove that now. To understand what comes, you'll have to have some understanding of double integrals. If you're not familiar with double integrals, it might be worth still watching through this presentation, but you won't expect to understand absolutely every stage. OK, here we go. Let's take a function. I'm going to call it g of t. I'm going to define g of t to be an integral of another function f. I've written it on the next page. Notice that the, d, the t dependence all appears in the top limit of the integral. There's a dummy variable u. Once the integral is performed and the substitution is made, u won't appear anymore. I'm also going to assume that we know the Laplace transform of little f to be some function capital F of s. Let's now ask about the Laplace transform of little g. To start with, we could call it capital G. Let's write that down first. Of course, that doesn't get us very far unless we actually write down the definition using the right integrals. So let's now fill in the right-hand side. Here it is. To start with, I've just put little g of t in the integral. But of course, to get further, we will need to substitute what we know about little g of t. That will put an integral within an integral. In other words, it will give us a double integral. Here it is. Notice the inner integral it's with respect to u, and its limits are 0 to t. To emphasize that that's an integral in itself, we could put some brackets around it. I've also put an arrow underneath to emphasize that the outer integral, 0 to infinity, belongs with the dt. I'm now going to start manipulating this expression to rearrange it in a more convenient way. Look at the e to the minus st. It doesn't depend on u. As far as u is concerned, e to the minus st is a constant. That means we can pull it in and out of the u integral whenever we wish. I'm going to do that for my next step. The e to the minus st will simply go inside the second integral inside and sit next to the f of u. We'll do it on the next page. Here it is. The next stage is to reverse the order of integration. This is the step you might not understand if you haven't dealt with double integrals before. What we have to do is describe the region of integration as it's presented at present. Look at the outer integral, the t1. We have values of t running from 0 to infinity. And for each value of t, the value of u starts at 0 and stops at u equals t. What we need to do is draw a graph of u against t and put the line u equals t on it. I'll do that immediately. I'm now going to shade in the region of integration. Remember for every t starting at 0 and carrying on towards infinity to the right, our u variable runs from 0, that's on the t-axis, and stops at u equals t, in other words on the sloping straight line. That means that our integration region is simply the region that I'm now shading. 
It's an infinite region, so I can't shade it all, but you should get the picture. However, there's more conveyed in this integral than we've as yet shown on the diagram. There is an order of integration. For every t from 0 to infinity, that's all the way along the axis of t, we're letting u start at 0 and stop on the sloping line. That is, we're integrating along the vertical arrows that I'll now draw in red. To reverse the order of integration, what we need to do is turn these red arrows round so that they're pointing from left to right, and then describe the, the new integration region in a different way. Let's do that on the next page. Here it is. Remember that sloping line is u equals t, but now we will need to describe it by the alternative version t equals u instead. Our arrows start on the left and carry on infinitely to the right. So let's describe what we're doing now. For each value of u starting at 0 and running up the u-axis, to describe the region of integration our t has to start on the sloping line. That's where t equals u. And it has to continue infinitely to the right. That description now allows us to write down the new order for integration. I'll start with a couple of integral symbols, with the du and the dt now in the opposite order to before. Here it is. The thing inside the integral will still be just as it always was, e to the minus st times f of u. However, now the outer integral is the u integral, and u has to start at zero and progress upwards to infinity. So we put those limits on the outer integral. Now the inner one, that's a t integral. For every u from zero to infinity, t starts on the sloping line. That's where t equals u. So we put u as the bottom limit on our inner integral. The t continues following the red arrows to the right, indefinitely, so the top limit on the inner integral must again be infinity. Here's our new version for the Laplace transform. The integration is now in the opposite order to before. The beauty of doing this, though, is that we can now perform the t integral very easily. The only thing inside it that depends on t is the exponential, and we know how to differentiate an exponential. Let's do that right now on the next page. We've still got one integral left, that was the u1. Its limits were 0 to infinity. I've anti-differentiated the exponential, and all that does is pull out a negative 1 over s. Of course, that t integral had limits on, and we must put those in. t equals u to infinity. The next step is to substitute the limits. The top infinite limit will go into the negative exponential. We know that f has a Laplace transform. So that f of u must be well behaved enough that the exponential will kill it off when t gets big. Hence the top limit will just give us 0. On the other hand, when we substitute t equals u, we will just get e to the minus su times f of u. It is a bottom limit though, so there will be an extra negative sign. That will change the minus that's already there at the front to a plus. Let's write out that step now. Here it is. Is it starting to look familiar? S doesn't depend on u, so we could pull the 1 over s out of the front. That leaves us with an integral f of u times e to the minus su du, from 0 to infinity. u is a dummy variable. Its name doesn't matter. We could just as easily have called it t if we'd want it. If we called it t, then what we would recognize here is the standard expression for the Laplace transform of f. So the answer we've come up with now is 1 over s times f of s. Do you remember right at the start we speculated that perhaps the Laplace transform of an integral would involve dividing by s? Well, sure enough, that's the case. We've proved it. Let's write out the final result on the last page. Here it is. The Laplace transform of the integral of f is 1 over s times capital F given that we know the Laplace transform of little f is capital F. That's proved the result that I wanted, and that concludes this presentation.